So if you would just talk to me, and if you want to say something a different way or start over or anything like that, just feel free to do it. Can I just first get your name and sort of your 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 affiliation, your university affiliation, just so we have it for transcription purposes? My name is Franz Lebel, and I'm a professor of computer science at Graz University of Technology in Austria. Um, give me, this will be, this is going to be a difficult question for you, I think, but give me the short history of you as, re as it relates to uh, the profession. Now, yeah, after 42 years, actually 43 now, of professional life, there's nothing short. Um, so if you want a short uh, story, hmm. um, my education was in Vienna, at the Vienna University of Technology, and my degree was in geodetic engineering. Actually, the, it was called geodesie in German. I graduated in 67, 1967 that is, and then uh, worked in Holland at the ITC, now called uh, an entity for geoinformation um, and earth sciences, I believe, about 300 people for work in the third world. Then I worked for NASA after that for two years in, in, at Pas in Pasadena at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Then I took a professorship in Austria in photogrammetry for about seven years. Then I uh, moved to the U.S. again and uh, became CEO of a mapping company called Mark Hurt Corporation. And then I started my own business in Boulder, Colorado called uh, Vexel Corporation. Then I went back to Austria again, a new professorship in computer science, actually in computer vision and computer graphics. Yeah, and that is a position I'm still holding but I, I, I took a leave now and then, so I was for a while the director, the CEO of an Austrian government-owned research facility with about a thousand employees. And um, I then took a leave of absence also to work uh, on the introduction of the ultra cam digital aerial camera and uh, then when we sold Vexel Corporation to Microsoft, I was obligated to work for two years at Microsoft. That has been over since 2007 or so. And I'm since at the university again, a professor of computer vision and computer graphics. Well, Fritz, from, from your sort of long perspective, there's been a tremendous amount of evolution of this industry and technology. What you look at it, what, what have been the most significant advances? Now, yeah, you're calling it an industry, and you're calling it the technology, and you're talking to a professor who is driven by science issues. You didn't call it I, a science. I apologize. Yeah? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, any, anything that gets some interested people together has multiple facets. It has the academic facet. Uh, it has the civil service facet. It has the industry creating tools facet. It has the users of the tools facet, which are the service op um, the service providers, particularly in this in, in, in this field. So I don't know whether I forgot one. Uh, the international learned societies and so forth. Everything, every one of those, I think, five items that I enumerated has changed dr dramatically. I mean, the industry as the provider of tools has basically been annihilated. There used to be equipment manufacturers building glass, metal, electronics uh, systems. They have gone by the wayside. None of those who existed in 1967 or so when I graduated from university, none of them uh, exists in this field. And people who do exist and do exhibit today are software companies. Uh, the only thing that's left specific to these industries are some cameras and uh, 
laser scanners. That's about it. But in terms of industry, it has, be, it has shrunk dramatically. Uh, in terms of academic facilities, it has shrunk dramatically too. Uh, when you look at North America, there have been professorships in photogrammetry. Uh, there were numerous professorships from Cornell to uh, uh, Berkeley to Illinois and Seattle and wherever they were, Purdue, Ohio. <coughs> and uh, when they, all, they all have fallen by the wayside. They, they no longer exist. So academically, a lot has changed. Um, uh <coughs> the conferences used to bring together 7,000 people and the conferences now bring together 2,000 people. So this all looks and sounds negative, but it doesn't have to be negative. It's um, the, the traditional um, uh, self-image of the field was very conservative. And while many things have happened that are exceedingly exciting, uh, the field itself has not been able to take advantage of that dynamics. The dynamics happened elsewhere, uh, not in the narrow photogrammetry area. Take the field of computer vision, originally image processing when it was an electrical engineering endeavor, and when computer science uh, embarked on this, they did it under the flag of computer vision. The conferences in computer vision are enormous. The, they, they have to close the registration because they can't accommodate so many people. Uh, the number of journals, the, the innovations, the patents, the, the companies that are coming about are enormous. Um, it's not, it, it hasn't inspired photogrammetry as much as it could have. Um, and so you asked me what has changed. I mean, the obvious has changed. Uh, 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 technology has uh, had an incredible ride over those last 40 years, uh, an accelerating r ride. Um, and uh, to an extent that anybody who looks at this says, I, I would have never believed that this is feasible. Um, and, and this technology ride has sort of eroded photogrammetry in its, in its say, importance. Um, but the activities are still there, but they're in other, in other fields, as, uh, as the example that I was using with, with, with computer vision. Uh, academically, learned society, industry, uh, service. So let me stop here with answering that particular question. Sure. Um, at, the, at the same time, the, the access to this technology, particularly for the public, has, has expanded tremendously. That's, that's, can you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the character of of things has changed, obviously. The I mean, it, photogrammetry understands itself as a, um, a, a discipline belonging to the broader field of mapping. That statement is probably 90% correct. There's a 10% of photogrammetry that dabbles outside of mapping, in archaeology, uh, maybe in in construction sites, um, in astronomy maybe, and so forth. But it was a realm of experts with a very high um, value attached to accuracy and predictability and reliability. Like other fields, take the printing industry, uh, similar situation, take color separation in the, in the reprography. And along came the internet, 
and along came the democratization of knowledge and, uh, uh, and the value of accuracy got eroded. Is it really important to, to hold on to this micrometer or to this centimeter or is 80% accuracy enough and the remaining 20% costing 80% of the effort are really not that appreciated? And that certainly happened. And it left the photogrammers a little bit out in the rain because other people came along and did quick and dirty internet maps uh, uh, and uh, car navigation, and nobody worries about whether that street corner is 10 centimeter over or not for street navigation. Um, so um, other people took over these, uh, these, these internet-related mapping efforts. I don't think there's many photogrammetrists involved at the companies called NAFTAC or Teleatlas uh, who are creating the infrastructure for these internet maps. What's, what, I believe um, I, I had read that you, you were quoted as saying film is dead. Was, was, was the shift from analog to digital the huge change in all of this? Obvious, yes. Uh, I mean, when I said earlier technology push, an incredible technology ride, then it all links in with the, with Moore's law, you know, the, the, the doubling every 18 months, which means uh, a million times uh, over 30 years. And actually, in certain areas, it was more than 10 million improvement over 30 years. Just think, take the cost of, of, of storage, computer storage. And uh, so, Clearly, that is at at the heart of it, but so is sensing development. Yeah, and you asked me about digital, so and film to to digital. Uh, yes, everything related to computing has had this enormous uh, advance. And again, I repeat, Moore's law says uh, a million times improvement over 30 years and certain segments were way, way uh, more dynamic than that. And um, you have today a situation where uh, there are no limits to digital imaging and processing. Sensors produce images in quantities and qualities and at, th at, 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 at repeat rates uh, than never before. Uh, you can, you know, like a, s a small city, I don't know how big Sacramento is, where we are today, but I figured it out for the city I live in, Graz. Uh, this was imaged in the past on 150 photographs on film. Today, anybody who goes and flies over the city will produce at least 3,000 images. But the, each of those 3,000 images has vastly more information than a single photograph on film had before. So you have there a factor of 20 just over the last few years by going from film to digital. So you have computing storage. It's so cheap. Uh, what does a terabyte cost today? Less than $100. Uh, you look at the processing power with the graphical processing units. Um, if you wanted to compute the digital elevation model from a single stereo pair, uh, and you would want to do that at every pixel, it would have taken you, uh, you know, not that long ago, weeks of computing. You didn't do it every pixel. You did it every 20th pixel, which cuts it down by a factor of 400. Today, you do it in one and a half minutes. So you can really say technology is not limiting your ability to do things. That, um, so the question is, what do you do with that? Uh, yeah. And the computer scientists take it and run with it. And photogrammetry, I, I'm curious to walk through the exhibit tomorrow. 
the uh, the innovation rates in photogrammetry are not commensurate with the uh, innovation rates in computing, and there's a simple reason for that. Uh, the 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 market is small, the profitability is small, therefore the money to invest in photogrammetry specific innovation is modest, so therefore the innovation is slow. When you're in computing, the profits are high, there's a lot of uh, reinvestment of those profits in, in R&D, and therefore the dynamics are, are much higher. So photogrammetry writes the coattails of this computing industry, but uh, that's not enough. In everybody writes the, uh, the the dynamic of the computing industry. Uh, not only not only photogrammetry. In order for photogrammetry to to vibrant to be vibrant, it needs to have photogrammetry specific innovation. And and that is where the where the problem lies. That uh, you can have a five people entity write some software and then distribute this via the internet globally. But your ability to innovate this is a function of how much uh, profit you have that you can plow back into the innovation. And that is where the photogrammetry has been notoriously um, weak. Now I forgot what your question was no, no, that I responded okay. to. Uh, the, so what's your sense of how all of these advancements will, will impact some of the, the critical applications, you know, in in disaster response, in in terms of being able to see the world, in peacekeeping applications, things like that. What's now? Yeah, a question. Looking at the uh, at who's being impacted. I mean, anybody who who goes through a photo. Well, let me restart this and say, what's a photogrammetrist? Uh, when is a person a photogrammetrist? Is this by the school he goes to or she goes to? Is it by the professional activity? What defines a photogrammetrist as a photogrammetrist? And uh, so you can play with words here and say, oh, this is really somebody who has done geography or environmental studies. And then from that drifts into the use of imagery. Now, is that a photogrammetrist, uh, or when is that person suddenly s a photogrammetrist? Is it by uh, loyalty to the field, uh, attending conferences, bringing your labor in, your volunteer labor at, that, at, at an organization like the ASPRS? Uh, so that definition of what is a photogrammetrist was very clear in the past when there was a, a professor of photogrammetry at Cornell University and his students were photogrammetrists and they went out and went through life as photogrammetrists. Somebody who goes into physical geography may hear the word photogrammetry along the way but has much more probably exposure to remote sensing and uh, for him whatever is photogrammetry may be a shrink wrapped software that you click on and it does certain things for you. Uh, so when you say disaster preparedness or peacekeeping or tracking changes or g global observations, uh, you're not necessarily talking about photogrammetry. You might talk about uh, um, um, mapping, yes, but it could be remote sensing, it could be geography. And that that is competition for somebody who says I'm a photogrammetrist. Yeah? In the future, I mean, this thing is going to go on with this computing uh, developments. I I'm too old uh, to really worry very much about what happens in the next 30 years. But uh, there isn't really any reason to believe that it won't proceed as in the past. Uh, so if 30 years gave a million times improvement, the next 30 years if this is also a million, I don't know, I cannot even imagine what that means. As little as I could have imagined when I graduated from college and I graduated computing with the Brunsviga calculator. Not with a computer, but it's a computer, yes, but uh, and logarithmic tables. You know, at that time, somebody said something about computing, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have even understood what they're talking about. So information flow, uh, um, the internet, uh, 3D, 
in everybody's uh, pants pockets you know, on these devices here. Augmented reality and all these things that uh, lots of people work on right now. How is this going to come out over the next 30 years? Fantastic things will happen, obviously. But whether they are going to be associated with photogrammetry, it's a se se separate story. What's your sense of what this will ultimately mean, what, where the, this continuous advance and sort of remarkable change and increased echo, what, what will it mean, do you think, for society in general? Just now, yeah, we have all been totally surprised by Mark Zuckerberg and Yahoo. And prior to that, before we knew that, uh, what I mean, Yahoo, I mean, of course, Facebook. Just, just start that again, if you would. Just say oh, that again. We've all been surprised uh, by Mark Zuckerberg and his success with Facebook. Um, prior to that, we're all in awe of Google, which started in 1999. And uh, by the time Zuckerberg started, Google was in everybody's... Uh, a conversation and then this thing started look w w what is this I mean this is all completely overwhelming us and so we're talking about information about everything everywhere you can look at everything wherever you are and things become um, incompatible with with the past understanding of data rights of, uh, of of who owns what in terms of intellectual property becomes very complicated. And so <coughs> mapping the Internet, geographic data, ownership of the data, availability of the data everywhere for everybody is, is the future. And, we don't, and I don't know. I don't think much about it. It's not, you know, but I think these things are running over photogrammetry. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I make the assumption that we will live in a, we will live, those who will live, <laughs> will live through uh, a fantastic availability of 3D models of the world with easy access to data and they don't need to worry about how it's being done. Uh, they may contribute that these words like neo-geography, neo-photogrammetry, everybody will be a photogrammetrist because he's looking around, takes his little phone, snaps a picture or ten, and they get uploaded uh, and exploited to update whatever the model is that uh, was, at, was available at that time. And uh, it puts in question what the current, how the current structures of civil service organizations, the industry, the data providers, the academics, the learned societies, how should they respond to that? It's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a real challenge. Things that you see? Now, yeah. I mean, from a top down perspective, yeah. I think uh, I said what's in me. <laughs> I just simply, you don't need to ask me much and you'll get these, these kind of stories. And typically, nobody's interested, you know, in, in the opinions of old people. Uh, you know what old means? You know it all, but nobody cares. <laughs> A wise old man told me a long time ago when I wasn't yet old, but he was. He said, you don't know what's coming. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome.